Welcome to the EdCollab gathering for the fall of 2021 into our session, Creating Creative Nonfiction. I'm Troy Hicks. I'm a professor of English and education at Central Michigan University. And you can find me online pretty much everywhere with the uh, name Hicks Tro. So if you want to reach out after the session with questions, definitely send me a message, hickstro at gmail.com or at hickstro on Twitter. And I'm very much looking forward to talking about this topic of creating creative nonfiction. I think that oftentimes we look at writing situations uh, and we look at the big three genres as they might be called in uh, common core parlance to say, oh, we have narrative, we have informational and we have argument. But what we also know from our own writing and the writing of others uh, that we study and enjoy is that it's really not always that simple. There's always something where a little flourish gets thrown into a piece of nonfiction or uh, a fiction writer will actually go in and describe something like in a historical fiction piece or something like that. And so we're always kind of blurring genres. And I think that uh, one of the big ideas that I'd like for you to take away from the session today is that if anything, we can invite our students to blur genres and to play with words and language and figurative language and to do so in thoughtful and productive ways while still also engaging with the content uh, that we would expect of them. And we're gonna kind of go through a process thinking about all of that. And so uh, I do have a short link that will take you to a handout document, and then that will also uh, take you back to these slides. So the short link is this bit.ly, and then these are cap case sensitive um, elements on the short link. So ed collab hyphen fall 21. And I will try to make sure that uh, those who are gathering all the resources for these video recordings have that. But uh, if you follow that, um, it should take you again to this Google Doc and uh, will then carry where you can click into um, a view only version of the slides. So again, I'm Troy Hicks and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. All right, so where does some of this come from? Well, part of it comes from my history and background as a writing center consultant, as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. It also comes from my experience working as a language arts teacher uh, at the middle school level and from years and years of experience working with teachers in pre-service teacher education as well as in-service education. And one of the things that uh, I really appreciate about those opportunities is that they give me moments to meet teachers and to write with teachers. And so two other educators uh, with whom I collaborated uh, on this project, and I've tried iterations of this lesson many times, but I'll tell you a little bit more about how it kind of came to be for this session today. Um, but it comes in the context of our book, Ask, Explore, Write, that I wrote with my friend and colleague, Jeremy Heiler, uh, with whom I've written a few other books, and then also Willine Pangle. So Jeremy is a middle school language arts teacher, and we wrote Create, Compose, Connect, as well as From Texting to Teaching. And we've done a number of different projects together through our local site of the National Writing Project, the Chippewa River Writing Project. Uh, so Jeremy and I were working together on this project, and then uh, Willeen is a colleague of ours who we met through uh, the biology department at Central Michigan University uh, when we did an institute um, on the Beaver Island, uh, at the Beaver Island Biological Station on Beaver Island in Lake Michigan. So uh, I wish I could talk a lot more about Beaver Island and how we work together, but uh, suffice it to say that for the context of this book, the three of us were kind of working through a couple different angles. I'm teacher educator, technology, writing. Jeremy is a language arts and science teacher. And then Willeen is a biology instructor. And so we brought all those angles together and thought, how are we using writing and writing to learn in different ways and in different contexts? And that brought us to this key idea that we must ask, explore, and write. And we were thinking throughout the book using a number of different tools, including science notebooks and having students create infographics 
and any number of other types of long and short-term writing assignments. And the one of the assignments that I contributed is one that I've adapted over the years, and that's this creating creative nonfiction. So you can find out more about this particular assignment in our book, Ask, Explore, Write, but you will also have everything that you need uh, from that bit.ly short link uh, that will be made available. All right, so from there, uh, one other quick note, and again, these links will be available in the slide deck. Uh, Jeremy was kind enough to curate all the resources from our book and collect them on his blog. And so if you link from that particular hyperlink on the slide, it will take you and you'll be able to go in chapter by chapter and find all the resources that we've been discussing, including some of the ones that we'll use today. All right. So Jeremy, Willine, and I, as we sat down and we thought about what it is we were really trying to get at with the book, it was this. Um, we assume and we believe and then we know, you know, through writing ourselves and our work with students, but also teacher research and showing what's happened in classrooms when students are invited to be writers. But then also just the history of writing and science and science notebooks. And you go back and you look at the you know, decades of writing that scientists put in notebooks. Um, that's part of it. And part of the peer review process and publishing and writing up lab reports and all those things. But even more so now, writing for the popular media and trying to explain scientific information in, in thoughtful and productive ways. So we begin with the assumption that writing and science are just part and parcel. They go together. Uh, they are two parts of a whole that in many ways, you know, we can't separate. Uh, obviously, we know and understand the world through language, and then science helps us understand what ha is happening in the world. And so um, in order to really have thoughtful conversations about science, we need to have students writing as scientists would. And then the angle again that we take with this creating creative nonfiction piece is that we give them just a little bit of an opportunity to play. We give them uh, what uh, my colleague uh, Kevin Cordy would call permission to play. Um, if we don't give students permission to play and let them kind of move around the edges and try something fun, try something different, then we're probably just going to continue to get the same old stodgy writing that we've always gotten in the past. And so the goal here is that we're trying to give them a framework for play while also still understanding the scientific concepts. All right, so here we go. We are about to create some creative nonfiction. And uh, again, you will have access to this Google Doc. And by all means, I would say, feel free to go ahead and uh, you know ad adapt and change and make a copy and, and do all the things that you need to do. Um, in fact, what I will do right now is, even though I'm not in view only, of course, you're, you're seeing me because I'm logged into my own document, but I'm just going to go ahead and make a copy so I can kind of mess around with it a little bit here. So I'll go ahead and make that copy and uh, we'll have that available to play around with. Um, I'm going to go back to the slides while that's loading. And um, the other piece of this, again, is that we're trying to teach a little bit about author's craft. We're trying to make sure that students understand that, yeah, you know, a little figurative language, a little rhetorical flourish here and there uh, can actually be something really powerful if used well and used strategically. And so we want to think about how to help our students do that in a thoughtful, productive way and not only because they're playing around and trying to make you know light of something, but because they're actually engaged in it and doing something meaningful with their writing. Right. So a couple of things to kind of set the stage. And I'm actually going to go into a little bit more detail on all of these things, uh, but just kind of the big picture here. Uh, what's going to happen? Uh, and you'll see this when we go ahead and we open up uh, that slide deck and we, we have those different resources uh, available to us is that we are going to be able to play uh, around with all of the language. And we're going to look at a mentor text. We're going to look at Bill Bryson uh, as an author who's done this for decades now and really brings in scientific writing in thoughtful and creative ways. 
And we're going to start with a little bit of a definition and overview of creative nonfiction from Lee Gutkind. Then we're going to look at two resources that I've relied on for a long time. One comes from Barry Lane with his wacky research project, and one comes from Tracy Gardner with her designing writing assignments. And I see that my Google Doc didn't quite cooperate the way I had hoped it would. So let me see if I can get this to go again. Um, pardon me. We'll see what happens there. Apologies. All right. No, it's just going to not cooperate. So, Amy, hopefully we can pause for just a moment. All right. That's the joy of trying to do these one take uh, recordings. Sometimes they just don't quite work the way you, you want them to. And so I apologize. All right, so I have my copy of this now. And uh, again, I'm going to walk you through this process and kind of talk you through the different parts of this activity. Uh, so it's something that you could replicate and use with your own students. So let, let's start with this idea about creative nonfiction um, and the idea that Lee Gutt kind of presents here. So this quote uh, comes uh, from uh, his book, uh, You Can't Make This Stuff Up. Uh, Lee Gutkind, from what I understand, now I'm not a creative writer and I don't study creative nonfiction on any daily basis, but my understanding is that he's kind of considered like the godfather of uh, creative nonfiction, and this was one of his recent books uh, with this idea that, um, you know, how do we do this? How do we actually get engaged in this process? And you can read a lot about him. If you do some Googling, I'm sure that you're going to be able to find more. But uh, this quote comes from his book. And again, it's this idea that in order to make nonfiction stories read like fiction so that your readers are enthralled um, by fact as they are by fantasy, that is what creative nonfiction does. Uh, the stories, though, still are true. Now, you have this quote here. And you know one quick activity you could have students do is ask questions of this quote, you know, certainly if they make their own copy of this Google Doc, you could have them highlight, you know, like what's most interesting to you, oh, this idea of enthralled, or oh, these ideas that, um, oh, what are these uh, factually accurate prose, what does that mean? Um, but they could actually interrogate that quote, um, they could go and, and read a little bit more about that, and then you could actually go to the creative nonfiction.org website and do some more exploration. So depending on exactly how much time you have and, and where you want your students to go with this, uh, you could delve in uh, a little bit more deeply. All right, we are though going to look at this and kind of think about, all right, um, we know that, yeah, there's this thing that's out there. It's called nonfiction. We know a lot of things about nonfiction. Probably by the time kids get to middle school and hopefully by high school, they know things about headings and tables of contents and indices and all those kinds of captions and bolding and italicizing and bulleted lists and all that kind of great stuff. So by the time um, we come back to this question and, and think about, you know, what is it that we're trying to do? Sometimes we just have to reorient ourselves and say, well, we're surrounded by nonfiction. We do a lot of nonfiction. Is this really, you know, isn't this just the style and the way it should be? Well, let's kind of interrogate that. Uh, and we're going to get to that when we look at Bill Bryson. But for right now, let's just look at some straight up nonfiction. Now, there's a good chance that you probably already have some nonfiction in your curriculum, or you could even partner with a science or a social studies teacher or someone else who is uh, having students use nonfiction, maybe even have an article of the week, you could do this. But this is kind of like that idea of, you know, going in and doing all these reading skills, but also reading like a writer. And so we want them to go in and look for all those typical nonfiction pieces, but then we're going to go down here and they're going to pick it apart a little bit. And so this is kind of a, a mini lesson. Now, again, you could do all this in one class period. This could stretch out over a few days, depends on how much time and energy you want to put into this one piece. But let's take a look. So we're going to go to this Black Bears uh, Facts site. And I picked this one. <laughs> There's a lot of Black Bear information that's out there. But I, I happened to pick this particular one because it was 
uh, pretty well loaded with lots of images and text and almost uh, an information overload. So um, we'll come back to that in a second. We'll let that load up real quick, see what's going on with that, and then we'll come back. But what we're going to do is we'll, we'll just read through it and we'll, we'll do that whole kind of good nonfiction thing, identify all these parts and pieces. And what do you see? Oh, it's a great text. Well, of course, because it's got captions and it's got headings and it's got all that kind of good stuff. All right. Well, wonderful. Um, and if it doesn't, then who knows? <laughs> uh, technology. Give me just one moment, please. Again, nothing like a good old website link uh, change uh, just to throw you off a little bit right in the middle of your presentation. So uh, I'm definitely going to make sure that I, I've already fixed that on the Google Doc. And, all right, so let's take a look and, and see what this website uh, kind of looks like. So if I click on this, it's going to take me to the American Expedition.us site uh, about the black bear. And we can go in and we can again, have students really take a look and see like, all right, well, what's in there? We see uh, bolded lists, we see scientific names, we see headings, we see captions, all these kinds of great things that are in there. We see subheadings for diet, we see hibernation, et cetera, et cetera. We've got images showing multiple things. We've got a video embedded. So it can all become, uh, you know, a point of uh, having kind of a larger, conversation about all right just nonfiction text but okay what would a writer need to do to make this text oh well you you know we can well we could assume maybe that's opinion all right um cunning and strength well where would we have to we'd have to find out well how does it relate to other animals and is it one of the strongest animals or not do research on that we'd have to go in and think about um, you know whether what does it mean by charming so this one even already has a little bit of uh, you know some different stuff in there but these facts of course are the ones that we're really interested in. you know they don't travel very far uh range of two to six miles oh okay you know so again what are the facts how do the facts work um how are they displayed in typical non-fiction fashion and what I'd like to have them do then is take that chunk and really go in and kind of unpack it and think about it a little bit more. And, you know, so we can go in here and we can say, all right, well, you know, where's a, a good piece of this puzzle that we can we can pull out? Now, I will apologize because the text that I have as a sample in my copy, um, the link uh, as I was getting ready, wasn't working and so I had to update and and go back to that USA expedition site and uh, this was only the best one that I could find at that point and uh, they didn't have that original text so I have original text from an earlier version of the site but again you can probably find similar types of writing other places but at any point we've gone through this first step we've invited students to go into that typical nonfiction piece and now we're gonna have them really go in and start to pick it apart. And it's a benefit, of course, to have it in the Google Doc right now where they could then share and collaborate um, either in real time by sharing the documents quite literally with the links and different partners are working or they can say, oh, hey, take a look, you know, come over here, take a look and see what I've got. Um, so I would have them go in and I'd have them kind of do a few things. Now, this is kind of a textual analysis. And um, I, again, point to other colleagues who kind of give me ideas and I borrow from them. Uh, this one comes in some ways from uh, Tom Liam Lynch and the work that he does with plotting points where he goes in and he uses word count analysis and frequencies and all kinds of things like that around um, classic and contemporary novels and creates charts and graphs. And I say, oh, well, maybe we could kind of do that in a lighter way uh, with a piece of nonfiction. And I kind of call it like the, the fact uh, per sentence ratio here, and you'll see what I mean. So the idea is that we first start this, like let's just dig in and let's just find the facts. Like maybe we're gonna highlight the facts and we're gonna do those in green. It's like, how many facts do we see? Um, okay, unlike grizzly bears, black bears are usually shy and seldom aggressive towards humans. Okay, so I'm going to actually count that as one. Um, and then I'm going to say, unless feeling threatened, I'd count that as two. Um, 
And then if you encounter a black bear, stay calm and do not run. So, okay, so there's another fact. And so you could have them go through and do that level of analysis and say, well, how many facts appeared in that first sentence? Oh, well, there were two in that first sentence. Oh, okay. All right, so let's just go out on the side and we would just put, you know, the number two in there or something to that effect. And you can kind of have them break it down and say, let's just look at it. Let's kind of see the density of facts in this particular paragraph. And that'll become important later when we look at the bill pricing piece. Then I say, um, all right, well, what's the most memorable sentence in here? Like, this is pretty straight up nonfiction. It's not super exciting. Uh, what do you see? What do you notice? And um, say, oh, okay, well, um, I don't know, maybe this one about attacks are very rare, but they happen when their heads down. That, that, that sounds pretty exciting. That's interesting. All right, cool. So then we'll go in, let's highlight that one in a different color. Let's make that one blue. All right, and of course there's a fact in there too. So they would have already gone through and done that level of analysis. Um, and then I say, all right, well, what makes it memorable? Like, let's go ahead and add a comment out here on the side and say, kind of tell me from an, a literary sense, like, what's ooh, piqued your interest as a reader? Um, but then also, why is that particular fact compelling to you? Because when you go to research your own animal, you're going to have to come up with something and really kind of articulate why that's important and, and be able to say that in a thoughtful way. So again, go out on the side and make a comment. Oh, wow, well, there's a couple facts in here. So what makes it memorable? Um, attacks are rare. Uh, when they happen, the bear will be on all fours with their heads down. So there's two facts in that sentence. You kind of get an image of the bear. Um, I can imagine the bear, you know, you know, being like this and doing this and that. So, you know, it's not, again, there's no similes or metaphors or personification or anything here. There's not even a whole lot of imagery. Uh, but the idea is that, boom, you, you've got this um, simple thing here and, and you've had students articulate what it is and why they find it important. And there you go. So they've done the analysis of the nonfiction and they've thought, okay, how do I do this? And, you know, not to like position it and set up some kind of straw man argument. Oh, isn't that so boring? It's just straight up facts. There's nothing in there. But to put that in conversation with what we're going to do next, you could kind of play it up a little bit. You could be a little, you know, sarcastic. Like, oh yeah, that's, well, that's great text. I mean, it does get the facts out there. It's pretty exciting, right? Ha ha. All right, let's take a look at what's next. Now, um, moving into this, uh, a few things to kind of note. Um, one, I'm just a Bill Bryson fan. I'm sure there are other <laughs> authors that do creative nonfiction um, and they might do it about other topics besides animals. Um, it just so happens, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we were on Beaver Island doing this activity in the context of all the biology field experiences we'd had that week. And um, as I was getting ready to prep that lesson, um, we were talking about bears. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> Bill Blight Bryson has a uh, piece from A Walk in the Woods. It happened to be um, the summer, either the summer of or right after when the Bill Bryson version in the movie of this was released. I think it was Nick Nolte and someone else was in it, Robert Redford maybe. At any rate, um, we said, all right, you know, so let's use it. It's timely. It's useful. Clearly, you could find other pieces of creative nonfiction and that's fine. All right. So I say, all right, well, hey, let's go in and let's read a, a walk in the woods. Let's see what's available and what's out there. And so we jump in. Now, um, not going to read all of it, obviously. Um, this is a lot <laughs> for right now. But what I would do is say, hey, let's actually, you know, go in and let's find a particular part of um, this that we find very compelling. And again, since it is available, yes, it's copyrighted material, but um, in educational fair use and transformational use, we're taking it because we're going to use it for analysis and critique. So I've just copied a few uh, paragraphs out of here and I've brought that back over here. All right, but before we have them dig in, okay, hey, remember earlier today or yesterday, whenever we did the analysis of the nonfiction, we're going to do something really similar, but we need to come at it with a slightly different angle. 
So the first thing is you would present to them this list and, and maybe depending on the age level and uh, you know thoughts that you have about what your students are willing to tackle and capable of, uh, you might have them look at this whole list or you might try to um, you know uh, boil it down a little bit. But they talk about you know kind of the facts and research and reporting and so forth. And then um, storytelling, narration, character, setting and scenes, all of these types of things. So again, this might be a little overwhelming for younger students. You might want to even take this and turn it into another Google Doc and narrow it down. But they would go through all this. And especially, I, I think this part right here is, is really important. And then again, you can see he references the gut kind. And we talk about some of the elements of creative nonfiction and why it's particularly important. All right, so we go back and we say, all right, we are going to analyze and we're going to look at a walk in the woods. Let's think about it. So let's kind of do our fact per sentence ratio and we would get that all kind of spelled out. Then we're going to go through it and look for literary analysis. You know, what, where are we seeing similes and metaphors and so forth? Um, and then what do they do for you as a reader? And then where does Bryson position himself, you know, as a character in the story? And what's the connection to real life? All right. So, you know, again, we go through um, the first part of it. Uh, if I were to be pawed and chewed, and this seemed to me entirely possible, the more I read, it would be by a black bear, Ursus Americanus. Okay, so there's one fact, there's a scientific name. Um, they can paw and chew humans. So again, you can go through and do all that highlighting. There are at least 500,000 black bears in North America, possibly as many as 700,000. So again, you could go through, and again, you, you can say, is that one fact or two facts? And that can be an interesting conversation to have with students. But they go through, they'd highlight, um, they do that fact per sentence ratio and density. And what I would argue is that Bill Bryson might even come out a little bit higher depending on how you actually decide to count all of this. And so you want to kind of be thinking about oh really what is it where are these facts what are they how are they fitting in and all that kind of stuff um but then we go back through and we're like okay yeah well what's that list you know what are all the things that we should be looking for um when we think about what creative nonfiction is well you know it's all these types of things and you know just like when we're writing a story we're going to want to use this type of stuff, especially figurative language and imagery and, and, and bringing in a different point of view, like how does Bill Bryson strategically use the first person here? And so when we go back, and I'll just pull that over there, when we go back to the text and we read that, we're like, oh, okay, so he talks a little bit, he has himself in here, then he does a whole lot about the bears. And then he does a whole lot about the bears again. Last thing, you know, they, they, and he's talking about it in the second person. If they wanted to kill you and eat you, dear reader, they could. Um, but then, um, you know, he doesn't really kind of come back to himself until later on. So like he situates himself early and then he kind of steps back and he puts the reader in there. And, you know, with this little segment, I, I think this is pretty powerful. Black bears rarely attack, but here's the thing. Sometimes they do. All black bears are agile, cunning, and immensely strong, and they're always hungry. And if they want to kill you and eat you, they can, and pretty much whenever they want. And so it kind of goes in there. And so we have that same fact here, right, about the bear's attack and not happening very often that we would have had um, up here. Um, attacks are very rare. Okay, well, attacks are not you know they don't happen very often so it's said slightly differently but it's in there but then you know what what does he do um to kind of personify that like he's putting the the bear like in the role of the actor you know they're agile cunning immensely strong maybe not precisely personification there but i think it does kind of get the point across um, and then uh, you can kind of see that he then goes and he draws in this other um, point. So he was talking about an author who had been writing about black bears, um, and then he brings in some more facts about the black bears. Um, now, you know, again, maybe he's not using too much here in terms of metaphor and simile, uh, but there's definitely imagery, right? Like you can imagine that black bear, that cunning, agile, immensely strong black bear, which 
yeah, kind of, you had that image from that more straight up nonfiction of the bear with its head down. But here we're kind of going, oh, wow, that bear has personality and it, it's got a mission and it is out to get me. Um, and so you can really kind of see that coming through. And then uh, I think the next part is this, we just kind of go like, well, okay, well, where do you feel this is really powerful? And I would even say that sometimes we can look at things like sentence construction, you know, like, um, you know, so he, here he does, he has these long kind of thoughtful sentences and even down here, more long sentences. And then he's got really three just powerful punchy sentences. Black bears rarely attack, but here's the thing, sometimes they do. So it's like, boom, it's just right there and, and he grabs you with that. And I think that, you know, again, you can, you know, talk to students about how that would typically be set up and the ways in which that might be situated. But here we can look at what Bryson does. And, you know, he's really trying to grab your attention. Boom, boom, boom. Three short sentences right there to grab your attention. And again, as I mentioned above, you know, he's, he's um, you know, talking about himself there. And he talks about you as the reader and positions you in there. And then the other thing, given a little bit more context about the book and it, maybe if my students are not familiar with it at all and I didn't want to read the whole package, you know, of or package, pardon me, passage of A Walk in the Woods, uh, I might just, you know, go and find the video uh, trailer for um, the, the movie and play it for them just so they could have context that he's prepping for this long walk on the Appalachian Trail. And there we would go. All right, now it's time to create your own piece. And I want to go back to the slide deck for a minute to give a couple shout outs because I think that part of this is um, just acknowledging uh, that this is complicated and it's challenging and there are other ways you can do this, uh, but also just to try to get some inspiration and ideas. So we're going to look at some ideas from uh, Barry Ling, uh, who has been a mentor uh, for me for many, many years. I first saw him when I was a middle school teacher, uh, one of his workshops, um, and have been able to be in touch with him through professional circles ever since. And then also Tracy Gardner, who I've also um, got to know as a colleague and uh, a friend through National Council of Teachers of English. So great just to know the people that write these books and then to be able to draw in from them. So let's, uh, let's go back. And again, these are, these are linked uh, from uh, the slide deck here. So you've got them there. And then I also put them in here. So uh, unfortunately, uh, with uh, Barry Lane's, you know, it is a book, you need to buy it, but he does have some resources that are available out there. So if you click on the book title, or the book title, pardon me, the cover in the slide deck, it will take you um, and you can see some of his wacky research paper templates. So if you wanted to look at some of those, uh, you certainly could. And then also uh, with Tracy's book, uh, the National Council of Teachers of English and the Writing Across the Curriculum Clearinghouse at, um, out in Colorado. Oh my goodness, Colorado State. Pardon me, my friends in Colorado. Yes, Colorado State, there we go. Um, have been able to digitize this book. And in particular, I'm going to direct you to chapter four. Um, so the Barry Lane book, and you know, I'm not using any one particular template from Barry Lane, just his whole idea in the wacky research paper. It starts out with this idea. Yeah, when I was a kid, I used to go to the library and fill up my dump truck with facts, and then I'd dump them all into my paper and I'd be done with my paper. Um, so I think it's always a, an interesting little story to tell, and you can probably even see that like on the preview on Amazon or something. Um, but you can dig in and you can take a look at some of those other templates and, and they're great. And then with Tracy's book, what I really like to do is kind of dig in and say, let's look at who all these different audiences and what these different purposes could be for writing. Like, who is it that we're actually writing for and what is it that we want to do? And so when we go in here and look, you know, we can see that she's got a few kind of framing questions for us about just how to rethink audience and purpose. But then it's really helpful because she has a number of charts or tables in the chapter that actually lists out some different audiences. So as your students are like, well, how do, who, I know, who am I writing to? What is this creative nonfiction thing? Well, what if you wrote to, and then they've got this list. Similarly, if you continue to go down, 
And if you want to expand beyond just a simple kind of textual based piece of writing, uh, she's got different genres and formats. Um, oh, I like this one too, like rather than just saying, oh, you're going to argue or you're going to persuade, here's the angle that you're going to take on that. It's probably a little bit different to uh, write something if you're annoyed as compared to if you're being sad. And, you know, so how might you bring a different angle like that in? Uh, and then again, later on, she's got some of these different, you know, genres and time frames and stuff like that. But where are they? There they are. So there are the different types of sources that you could draw from. But I would also say these are the types of things you could have students write. And then that connects back to the Barry Lane piece. So and I'll show you a couple examples of that from some of the teachers uh, with whom we've worked. All right, let me clear some of the clutter here so we can get back to where we need to be. All right, so we're now again thinking, how do we get students to do all this stuff? You know, they, they've read uh, Bill Bryson, they, they looked at this sample, but still, wow, this is tough. How do I get them to do that? All right, well, I've tried to provide you with a template. Uh, I'm very much a fan of like they say, I say, and I know uh, Fisher and Fry have done some things with templates before in the past. Some people would say that templates limit you. I would say that they're a great place to start, right? So what I tried to do was take a couple of the sentence structures from what Bill Bryson had done, and then I would say, go take a look, you know, let's go, you know, find your animal, get your facts written down, and then let's go back and let's use this great template of creative nonfiction that we can find from Bill Bryson and let's create our own. And so what I would have them do is use these three uh, sentence starters or templates. If you were to be blank and blank, and this seemed to me entirely possible the more I read, it would be by a blank, blank. All right, and we go back to the bear. So if you were to be pawed and chewed, and this seems to me to be entirely possible the more I read, it would be by a black bear, Ursus Americanus. So if you were to be um, stung or, you know, <laughs> whatever, I, I don't know, um, you know, annoyed and stung, it seems to me entirely possible, the more I read it, it would be by a wasp, the following the Latin name or something like that. All right, so you kind of get for that first template. All right, there are at least so many of these things and possibly as many of these things. So again, I've borrowed from this sentence right here. And again, your students are going to have to go through and do this research and find these sources and make sure that they're you know, being accurate and, and trying to figure out what scientists know about their different species that they're exploring. So they could do you know, that comparison numbers. And then I love this sentence, you know, something for this combo of sentences. They rarely blank, rarely blanks. But here's the thing. Sometimes they do all blank are blank, blank, and blank, and they are always blank. So again, I was saying this one earlier, the bears are hungry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we now can see that there are, you know, now, all right, how do we do this? So again, we go back to the, well, wasps rarely sting, but here's the thing, sometimes they do. All wasps are such and such and such, and they're able to do this and that. And so we think about, you know, whatever animal it is we happen to be, um, doing and we can go from there. Now again, Bill Bryson may not fit the bill for you and your students. You might have to go back and kind of think about it, you know, but at least it's a sample there. So I would quite literally have them, you know, copy this right here and then they just go ahead and copy it and I'd say, hey, go ahead and just plop that right here in this text box so I can find it later when I go back in your Google Doc and you can take out the bullet points at that point. Uh, dear students, and uh, go ahead and just write away and so they would get started. All right, so that kind of gives you the overview. I want to show you just a couple little tiny snippets of examples, and you can find these links on Jeremy's site, and we mentioned them more in the book, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, Beaver Island along the way. So you have that, you have the link, we'll keep going. All right, so we've done this lesson a couple times, and it, it's been a while, unfortunately, uh, being the times that we're in, that we've been able to go to Beaver Island, we're hoping to again next summer. Um, but a few years ago, we, we had, were going pretty regularly and we had these two examples. So um, the one over here, uh, this whole idea, oops, I'm sorry, uh, the humans will often fear the arrival of aliens who will lay claim to everything they find. 
uh, Lexi Jensen was actually writing about um, an invasive species in the Great Lakes we had studied uh, on the island. Uh, I think it's the brown goby or the round goby. Oh my gosh, uh, my mind is escaping me. We'll have to go back and look at the link <laughs> from Jeremy's website. Um, but we talked about, you know, how they, we were out on the boat and they dropped the camera down in the water with the robot and they were showing us these fish along the bottom and how they were, you know, competing against the natural um, species that would be there. And so she got back and then we did the creating creative nonfiction lesson and she's like, I'm just going to go right in and, and write about these gobies. So that's what she did. And there's a little snippet of it there. The other one over here, we took a slightly different angle. Um, we had been talking a little bit about like infographics and other ways that students could represent their work. And so Shannon Oswald had, um, we had gone out to the dunes and we were looking at the succession of the plant life from the lakeside into the upper dunes and the intermediate area of the dunes and then up toward the forest. And they were doing like transect tracks and like counting species and things like that. So she got the idea of saying, wow, well, wait, we have these three different zones and dunes. It's kind of like real estate. Yes, light bulb went off. So she actually did her creative nonfiction by creating these real estate ads. And so this one is uh, the one that's in the intermediate zone, the Valley Values, live in the middle and enjoy an easy life with friendly community. And you can see she talks a little bit there and kind of gives hints about the types of plants that would uh, be best served to live in that area. And so you can have fun with it. Um, again, going back to Tracy's work and uh, Barry Lane's work, thinking about all the different genres and ways that you could have students take that initial little nugget, that kernel of writing, as Gretchen Burnaby might call it, uh, and then expand it into something much bigger. All right, so with all that, we're going to kind of bring it home here at the end. Um, you know, again, when Jeremy and Willine and I were working on the book, we kept talking about how can we, you know, we've talked about writing in the content areas and disciplinary literacy and writing across the curriculum forever. How are we really going to do this? Well, let's try to present some ways. And so, you know, we wanted to make it as useful as possible. And again, I hope that my contribution to this uh, quest is that the creating creative nonfiction lesson will indeed be useful uh, for you and your students and might open up some new frontiers and some new possibilities. Um, and then as we, we think about it, we're like, okay, well, what, what's the goal here again? And to kind of almost come full circle, as we close the book, we said, you know, we believe that the process of asking, exploring, and writing can help our students adopt the skills and dispositions that they need to be scientifically literate now and in the future. And we still believe that uh, quite firmly. And if anything, uh, we need those types of skills and that type of citizenry uh, now more than ever. We want to make sure that uh, everyone is uh, understanding our role in the world and understanding data and understanding how they can make informed decisions individually in their community, in their nation, around the world. And so with that, uh, I'll just give a quick nod to Slides Carnival uh, for the thanks for being able to use this template. And I will again go ahead and make sure I pull that bit.ly short link up in a nice uh, robust and zoomed in way. So you can see that. Um, so the resources here, bit.ly, ed collab together, case sensitive hyphen fall 21. Uh, my hope is that uh, you will be able to soon try creating your own creative nonfiction. And very soon after that, welcoming your students to create their own creative nonfiction. I do truly think that the process can be incredibly powerful and um, if you let it be quite fun as well. So thank you again for listening to the workshop. Uh, enjoy the rest of the sessions. And again, please reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns, hickstro at gmail.com or hickstro on Twitter. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you again soon.